Hello everyone. As you know, my name is Caroline Heim. I'm an Associate Professor of Theatre in Queensland University of Technology in beautiful sunny Australia. But in a former life, I was an actor on New York City stages and other US capital city stages. And I'm Christian Heim, and as you know, I'm a psychiatrist, and I'm a clinical director of Tasmanian Mental Health Services. I'm associated with the University of Queensland, but in a former life, I was a classical musician and a lecturer in music. Together, we are giving you an impulse on resilience, to optimise your resilience and the resilience of your university students. We build resilience together. So all the information that we'll be giving you in the talk and in the workshop is drawn from our book, Resilient Relationships, also drawn from our experience as performers and uh, as university lecturers looking to maximise the mental health of our university students. But the main focus of the impulse is going to be on your experience of resilience in the workshop which will follow this talk. So in the workshop, we'll be giving you really practical exercises so that you can embody resilience. We'll also be doing a little bit of Shakespeare and having a bit of fun and clowning along the way. But first, the theory before the application. The thinking before the action and the calm before we kick up a storm. And for that theory, I'm going to pass over to Christian. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, this talk is to help us understand resilience. What we've heard about strengths and what we've heard about emotional intelligence will tie in really nicely for what we're doing here. My job is to distill the vast science of resilience and my clinical expertise uh, working with mental health people uh, to present to you a few ideas that you can take home from this and practical ideas that you can use in your lectures and your tutorials. Resilience cannot be taught, but it can be enhanced through together experiences. So things like, will I make it? Have you got what it takes? Will they pass the exams this year? These are questions about resilience. And you might know the science. The science says to be resilient, you've got to have good coping skills. You've got to be able to regulate your emotions. You've got to be optimistic, that's very important. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be able to think positively. And you've got to have a vast array of family and friends. And then you go, right, I'm going to try to be optimistic. I'm going to try to be flexible. And then you fail. And you feel worse about yourself and you go, damn, I'm never going to be resilient. I fail, we all fail in this. So knowledge is not enough. It's a bit like reading a cookbook and expecting to be a good cook, right? Um, you read a cookbook, but you've got to practice cooking before you're any good, but it's the experience of eating food uh, that will refine you and share the experience with other people. That goes, okay, good, I know what to do now, and you'll get better. So it's the same thing with resilience. For an outline today, we're going to look at four questions. What is resilience? Yeah, you, you, you do need a definition. Um, what's the next thing? Okay, what happens in the brain uh, to, to create resilience for us? Um, why is a long-term focus better than short-term pleasures? And why are relationships important? Because the take-home messages I'm giving you are two. Number one, resilience is strongly related with relationships. And the one thing to take home today, if you sleep through all of this because you've had lunch and your blood pressure is dropping, is to take care of your relationships. If there's a phone call to somebody that you need to make, if there's somebody that you're not going, getting on with and you know that you should, if there's a friendship that you just want to take to the next level, do it. This is what life is about. Do it. It's a together experience. The, together take, uh, the second take home <laughs> message is that uh, long term contentment leads to resilient. Short term contentment, a uh, short term pleasure, does not. Overall, it's the together experiences that build resilience. Good. 
Why did you do that? <laughs> okay, you did that, that's right, that's right. That's exactly right, Dylan, because I gave you an invitation to join me in a little bit of music. It's the most basic music that we can have, just a little bit of clapping, but it's a together experience. And because, as Sarah said, we are social creatures, we love together experiences but we live in a society that are taking away all these together experiences. All right, so, so let's look at the first question. What is resilience? The year is 1850. We're off the coast of North England, and in that year, 784 people die because the storms and the tempests are so bad. So the Duke of Northumberland says, I'm going to run a competition for somebody to design me a boat that will be safer out there. James Bleacher wins a competition. He says, I've got a design of a boat and it doesn't matter how much the waves bring it down, it will self right It will get back up to position automatically. This, I find, is a great metaphor for resilience in us. Psychological resilience is the ability to get back up after we've been battered by stress. So there are several definitions of resilience, but the one that I want to give you is that it's a process. It's not part of your personality or your character, and it is definitely not stoicism. Stoicism is where you grit your teeth, bear it all, and like a, a tree, an oak tree in a storm, that can crack. Resilience is more like a willow that will actually go with the flow but bend back. So my definition is that resilience is a process. It is a dynamic process central to life. It is an attitude and an approach so that we're able to maintain wellness during stress. That's really hard. That's really hard. How do we measure it? Well, you can't measure it directly. You can only infer it from function. So in a society where mental illness rates are going up and they're soaring and the in, uh, illness rates, these, uh, these increases are real, that is a marker of unresilience. So in our book, we measured it by seeing how couples respond to stress in their relationship. We took 40 years as a marker. By the way, Christoph, I believe you've been married for more than 40 years, yeah? <laughs> that deserves a clap. <laughs> How many people are in a long-term relationship? What's long-term? Long That's right, if you consider a long-term, long-term relationship. Okay, keep your hand up if you want it to last for 40 years or more. Okay, so the question is, will your relationship have the resilience to last for more than 40 years? And you know what? It, the answer is not yes for everybody, all right? But it's gonna take effort. And we measure to, can you withstand stress? We measure resilience by how you withstand stress. We measure resilience by how your students withstand stress. What stress are your students under? I mean, my gosh, look at our society. It, this is the best time to be alive. Are they under any stress? You bet they are. They're under huge amounts of stress. Firstly, as a psychiatrist, I see a lot of people in uni student days because they have gone from structure and guidance to no structure and chaos. And because of that, they have to motivate themselves to want to do something. They have to motivate themselves just to turn up to class. They have to motivate themselves to gain the knowledge that they are under pressure to gain. And they are, have to motivate themselves to have success experiences, which include passing exams. All of that while they're trying to form an identity as to who they are and where they belong in the world. And that is not easy, particularly in a society that says go for the short-term pleasures. Our society doesn't want us focused on long-term contentment because we'd spend a whole lot less money that way, right? But if you go for short-term pleasure, and we all know our short-term pleasures, okay, we will part with our money just that little bit more. And the thing is that this does not build resilience. And this is a paradox of resilience. You see, if there's too much stress, we would all snap. Big amounts of stress do not 
increase resilience. But you see, small amounts of stress also does not build resilience. As Xavier told us, you need the carrot and the stick sometimes. You need the challenge. You need to be able to have obstacles to overcome. And studies show if you can overcome small obstacles, that prepares you for overcoming larger obstacles. And our society is saving us from the stress, or trying to. And because of that, it's actually more stressful. We've got to have the stress. Medium amount of stress builds resilience. All right, so. Let's go to the second question. What happens in the brain with resilience? What does a brain do to become more resilient? It does two things. One is it develops. It develops from being a child through adolescence to adulthood. Secondly, there are neurochemical changes that I will take you through in the brain that help build resilience. Children. Children, by definition, is a person that needs a parent, otherwise they won't survive, right? But the thing about children is the child's brain needs certain emotional inputs to be able to develop healthily. And there was a study in 2019 that articulated what childhood needs there are that we ideally all get. You need parents who can acknowledge your feelings, uh, that will make you feel safe, that will stand by you. You need a community of adults that will be interested in you. You need to be able to build traditions. You need a sense of belonging at school, and you need some friends along the way. That's what the brain needs to develop resilience. And you're going, I, I, I didn't get all of that. Well, I didn't get all of that either. Caroline didn't get all of that either. But here's the good news. It is normal to be resilient. It is normal to survive. And if you are here past the age of 18, which you all are, you survived your parents. <laughs> okay, and for some of, the, for some of you, that, that was really difficult, all right? For some of us, it, it sounds like, you know, well, so what? But the resilience that is there is amazing. So this is how it translates for you in your lectures and tutorials. You're not a parent but you are a mentor. And as a mentor, you can start giving people some of these experiences. You can build traditions in your class. You can build a sense of belonging in your class. You can stand by your students in your class. You can validate their feelings. You can give all of these, and if they didn't have it in their childhood, you are giving them a corrective experience. And their resilience will be enhanced just a little bit. We have done this in Caroline's classes and we have seen the results. It helps amazingly. Adolescence, what does a brain do during adolescence? Okay, well, let me bring you to a child, four years old, feels an emotion, anger and frustration. What does it do? Tantrum on the floor. A child goes straight from feelings to behavior. Nothing in between there. Uh, by the time you're an adolescent, your brain goes, okay, that's not going to work well for the rest of our lives. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to prune those connections, cut them off between the feeling center and your acting center. And that actually gets done. Those connections get cut. And what we're going to do is we're going to strengthen the connections between your feeling center, the limbic system, and your frontal lobe, your thinking center, so that you can become an adult. And as an adult, the ideal, because we all throw tantrums occasionally, the ideal is to go from feeling to thinking. Emotional intelligence. What am I feeling? How do I want to respond? What is the behavior that's going to give me a good consequence rather than what I've been doing for years and years that isn't working for me, right? So in your lectures and your tutorials, you're dealing with people who are just post-adolescence or young adult age. And during this time, you will need to use feeling language to validate them, in a sense, as children. How did you feel about that? Do you feel okay here in the classroom? How do you feel about doing this course? But when you want them to problem solve and move forward, you switch to thinking language. How do you think I can help you with this? What do you think you need to do to make your essay writing better? Do you think this is the right pathway for you? And you appeal to their thinking center, and this builds 
resilience. Adulthood. We all grow into adults, and we've got it all together, right? None of us has a tantrum. Uh, we, we all choose the behavior that we want. Now, I'm saying that because we don't. We all fail in this, and we all have our mechanisms to cope with that. Some of them are useful, some of them aren't, right? But as an adult, we still need our security. Our security is our relationships, be it your love partner, be it your parents, your children, your friends, your colleagues, or even people in the street. Value the people around you because they are your resilience. Even if you don't get on with them, they are still your resilience. And guess what? You are their resilience. Just by being there, you become resilient for the people around you. In the lecture, and uh, in lectures and tutorials, you again build this sense of relationship that we are not here as we are just here, not just for the learning, right? We are all getting the information, we are all moving towards a goal, but we're here together as people. And having a meal together last night and tonight embeds that. It does more than just design or lecturing techniques because life is so much more than design and lecturing techniques. It's part of being adults and being together because together experiences build relationship. Okay, very good. Now, you, you'll notice that you have to sort of think, oh, have I got it right here? And you are doing things that maybe you haven't done before, right? Because your brain is going through a feeling and a, um, uh, a rhythm, right, that you can't articulate in your head, and then you are translating that with a bit of concentration as a skill because you want to be together with everybody else. I want to be a part of that. I want to clap as well because together experiences build resilience. Okay, that was question number two. Question number three is, Christian, why is it important to go for long-term contentment rather than short-term pleasures? Give me a reason. It's part of the definition of resilience. Because when you've got stress, you want to overcome that and bounce back to be here tomorrow. I want to have some resilience today, so I'm actually here tomorrow. It's that long-term focus and we want to be here tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. The brain is a future-focused organ. It learns through positive experiences and negative experiences to ask itself, what can I do better next time? And then it'll change the environment a little bit or change behavior a little bit so that you can survive, but more than that, as humans, of course, thrive. I can do just that little bit better. And so the comparison in your mind has to be, how, I, how was I last week? Am I a better person now? Am I getting just a little bit better? And the answer to that is sometimes yes, sometimes no, but the incentive is to move forward into a future. But Christian, that's no fun. Work first, play later, put in the effort before you get the rewards. Who wants that? I want fun, I want fun, I want fun. And we all do. And here's the good news, you can have your fun as long as you link your pleasure with purpose. If you can reward yourself for having done something, then it'll taste better, it will feel better, you will move forward into a future. It's Oktoberfest here, just last week, okay? Hands up anybody who enjoys their beer? Okay, wine, wine drinkers? Yeah, yeah, good, good. If you have a glass of wine or beer with some friends on a Friday night, that feels really good because you've done a week of work and you go, oh, that was a hard week, wasn't it, guys? You know, it was nice, blah, 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 and off you go, and you enjoy yourself. Imagine if you turned up to a company, you had your 9 a.m. morning meeting, and 10 o'clock they said, right, down in Slokal, we're going to get to our beer and our wine. What, 10 o'clock on a Monday morning? It's not that it's just too early, but you haven't done anything to deserve it. And it actually doesn't taste as good. It's sort of like, can I get back in the office and, and let's, let's do some work first and then we will get the pleasure. Linking the pleasure and the purpose means you actually get to have both. Here's the catch. We live in a society that will give you the pleasure first 
and you don't have to do anything for this pleasure. It is so easy to find pleasure these days. Why should I do the work? Answer, to become resilient so that you can actually withstand stress and get back up to where you were. So that's a message that in lectures and tutorials you can give to other people. You paint pictures of how good it will feel when you pass the exam, when you finish the essay, when you do the group project, huh? and uh, uh, then we'll reward ourselves somehow. The brain, as I said, learns skills in positive or negative experiences. If you have somebody in your class that has experienced trauma as a child, there's no need to pity or to sympathize because you know what? They have learned skills that you and I can only dream of. They are streetwise like you won't believe. They can problem solve like you won't believe. They have hidden talents, okay? If you grew up in a chaotic um, household, then you're actually better, the studies show, at skipping from one topic to another, multitasking and doing all that sort of stuff. You're just better at it. Why? Because your brain adapted, it's a skill. So look for the hidden talents in the people that you work with and your students. But we've got to be realistic about what can be achieved. So just to touch upon that, I'll ask Caroline to talk to us about Josie. So Josie is a university student of mine. In 2019, dreadful bushfires hit northern Australia, where my university is, ravaging the whole land. Josie lost her family home during those bushfires. In 2020, the global pandemic hit, and she studied her final year of high school online. In 2021, she came to university. She had to study online again in a small apartment in lockdown. In 2022, the Brisbane River flooded. Josie lost her home a second time, her little apartment. When I met Josie, she was incredibly timid, uncertain about her future, had so much anxiety. She's still timid and she's still got a lot of anxiety, but with the support of her peers and some of her university lecturers, she's doing okay. So during that time, for students like Josie, what we did in our school was we put up a padlet, which we called a fear wall, and we asked all of the students to put up what their fears were. Hundreds of students put up what their fears were. I did a little survey of the fears, and the number two fears for these university students were a fear of failure and a fear of being judged. Just a few weeks ago, post-pandemic, I did the same survey, and the two same aspects came up. The students had a fear of failure and a fear of being judged. Brain. Brain, yes, yes, I'm gonna talk about what goes on in the brain, in a fear of failure and a fear of being judged. For Josie, her university became her resilience. It became her safe place. It became her set of people to keep her on track for a future. She lost her home twice. It was unbelievable that she is still at university. It'd be nice to say that she got honors and she's now doing a PhD program. That's not resilience for Josie. Still being at university is resilience for Josie. All right, so we're talking about a fear of failure and a fear of being judged. And any of you who have stood up in front of a class uh, or have lectured, may have experienced a fear of failure or may have experienced a fear of being judged. I'm now gonna go through what happens in the brain during that sort of a fear. All right, so you know that you have to give a lecture and you feel this Ugh, pit in your stomach and your hands start shaking, your, you start panicking, your, your, your heart starts racing, your, your mouth goes dry and all of that happens automatically. All right, let's go through and see what happens in the brain. To do that, I have to take you to a place called the hypothalamus. Hypo means under, thalamus was a, a, a place right near the center of your brain. The hypothalamus is the center in your brain that converts emotional impulses to physical responses. It is the hub of your survival. 
It is how we process emotions physically. It's like a director that says to the pituitary gland, which sort of sits right next to it, pituitary gland, I need you to make a few hormones for us here because I'm gonna get the, uh, the body to do a few things here. All right, so the pituitary gland, what do you need? The pituitary gland's got like somewhere between 12 and 20 different chemicals that it makes and the hypothalamus says to it, send some of this down to the adrenal glands, we're going to go into stress mode. Fine, now I've taken you down from the brain down to on top of your kidneys, which is about here on your back. On top of your kidneys sit two little glands. These are called adrenal glands. They're called that because they sit on top of the kidneys. They get something from the pituitary gland that says, put us into fight and flight mode. So they go, squirt. And all of a sudden you've got all this adrenaline and cortisol in your system and you feel it as, ooh, right there. And you feel it. And that's when your heart starts racing. That's when your breathing gets shallow. That's when you're ready to run. You start shaking and you are not in control. That happens automatically because your hypothalamus wants you to survive. Why did it do that? Because the amygdala, which we heard about before, sees giving a lecture as a threat and it wants to survive. So it generates pain, emotional pain and physical pain, and tells the hypothalamus this is what needs to be done. In comes oxytocin. Now, Oxytocin is something that we've known about for about 30 years now, but in the last five or six years, we started to see what oxytocin actually does. You'll probably know oxytocin as the love drug, the hug drug, that gives you that feeling any time that you trust somebody, any time that you love somebody, any time that you feel friendship, uh, you do a business deal, and you're feeling good about being part of the human race. Thank you, oxytocin. But it does more. You see, the oxytocin that gets produced in our anterior cingulate gyrus, which is my favorite part of the brain, if you're allowed to have a favorite part of the brain, uh, that sort of keeps us connected as people. And so this is where oxytocin uh, gets generated. And what it does is it says to the hypothalamus, chill, it's all right. What's the name of this part? This part, the anterior cingulate gyrus, okay. So anterior, it's Latin, but it's actually not that hard. Anterior means at the front, a gyrus means a bulb, uh, bulge, and cingulate means it's like a belt. And it wraps around corpus callosum, right, okay? And it looks like a, if you find it, look up anterior cingulate gyrus, and that's, that's what it is. And it produces the oxytocin that says to your hypothalamus, chill. Because, you know what, if you fail, if you're judged, people still love you. It doesn't matter. And that actually happens physically and we can measure in the urine that people who have a lot of love early in life produce less stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. But there's more because oxytocin also talks to your amygdala which produces pain, emotional and physical, and fear and anger and all sorts of stuff, okay? It says to the amygdala, chill. <laughs> it doesn't matter if we're in pain because people still love us. And this is physical, this is what I'm trying to get across. It's a miracle, it's physical, but there's more. Oxytocin cleans out your frontal lobe and cleans out all the white matter which connects all your neurons so that your neurons in your brain can talk to each other better. What does that mean? That means you think clearly. Because when people love you and you are in relationship with people, life feels good and stresses are down so that you can actually think your way through things even better. So the take home message is that even a fear of failing and a fear of judgment can be alleviated by having good relationships with the people around you. So if, if you've got a phone call to make, all right, or if you've got somebody to talk to, please do that. Um, I want to bring up somebody who we celebrate as a fear, who has failed more than anybody else, Roger Federer. Since 2003, up until now, Roger Federer has lost 60 grand slams. I'm serious, he's lost 60 grand slams. There's not many people who've lost more than he has. I know, we remember the 20 that he has won, 
But if he didn't put his hand up for failure and fail more than he succeeded, he wouldn't have succeeded. So the take home message for this and for your students is that success is success. Failure is success. The only failure is not trying in the first place because not trying in the first place is giving up an opportunity to become more resilient. Last question. Why are relationships and together experiences important? Okay, there are a few languages going in here. We're going to go for French. If you don't know this in French, then please just join in with any language that you want to. Just join in as soon as you recognize it, okay? Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, dormez-vous, dormez-vous, sonne le matin, sonne le matin, ding, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong. Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, Sonne le matin, Sonne le matin, Ding ding dong, Ding ding dong. Okay, well done, this is a, a clap. When's the last time you had a sing along? When's the last time you were around a campfire and you, and you sang Deutsches Volkslieder? <laughs> right, I'm, I'm part of a German speaking community in Sydney and as a child, every year we had a harbour cruise on Sydney Harbour and you've got to imagine 200 people aged between eight and 80 singing songs like Miau komm geliebte Katze and Trink nicht zu viel Kaffee. All right. Such dumb songs. Why did we do it? Because we loved it. And we felt together as a community. You just feel together as people. It's a very uncool thing to do, right? Why is it an uncool thing to do? Because we live in an individualistic society. But those sort of experiences are what bind us together. So in summary, resilience is coming together for two things. Relationship builds resilience and being able to go for long-term contentment rather than short-term pleasure builds resilience. And I'm going to finish off with a story. Somebody that I took care of, I'm going to call him Keith. Keith was in hospital more of his adulthood than he was out of hospital. He suffered from uh, severe schizophrenia and There was a time when Keith fell in love and he was out of hospital for three years. And then the relationship broke up and Keith was back in hospital. Now we would say, oh yes, placebo effect, all right, or um, his girlfriend helped him with his medication and did all of that. And yes, all of that was happening. But we now know that his brain was actually responding to oxytocin from a good relationship that he was in and it became more resilient and life became more meaningful at that time. So those two things, resilience in relationships and a long-term process, goes through this common pathway of oxytocin leading to more resilience in the body. And together experiences is what will build resilience. To have a few together experiences, Caroline will now take us through a workshop and she will be working on specific issues that university students experience and you will be able to use these to enhance uh, resilience in your students. Thank you for listening, Caroline. Thank you, Christian. Okay, so this workshop is about building resilience. We build resilience together. So all of the exercises that we're going to be doing are actually taken from actor training, adapted for resilience. So I'll be drawing on the theoretical basis of Konstantin Stanislavski and Bogart, Rudolf Laban, a little bit of Shakespeare and a little bit of clowning as well. And I have to tell you that all of the exercises that we're doing Uh, have been done in my, of course, in my classes at university, but also with, in other disciplines, so not just in theatre, and also with adults too, just to make you feel a little bit more comfortable. 
So uh, the structure of the workshop is basically we're going to do a check-in and check-out, which was mentioned in the last session, which is fabulous. I've been doing check-ins and check-outs with my students for about 10 years now. Uh, then we'll be doing some exercises along the way and a Shakespeare interlude in the middle to see what Shakespeare had to say about resilience. After each of the uh, exercises, I'm going to pop up an Instagram-style post-it note up on the screen here. Um, I use these post-it notes in my lectures regularly, and you're very welcome to use those in your own work um, or in your classrooms. I'm also going to pop up some uh, quotes from our book. So we're going to start out with a check-in. I just need to get my clicker clicker here. Sorry about that. Forgot my wonderful clicker. We're going to start out with a check-in. So what colour are you feeling at the moment? Think of a colour that you're feeling, not blue, red. You're all design people. Think a, a little bit, bit, bit deeper, something like um, vibrant magenta or the colour of blue jeans after I've been wearing them for 10 years or the colour of the sky after a storm, something like that, okay? So colours, what colour are you feeling right now? Christian, I'm going to start with you. Oh, well, I'm feeling a combination of blue and yellow, which you find in the sky, uh, particularly during midday, because I love the sunshine, and I want the things that are happening here to brighten up the whole of the world. Okay, great. Who else would like to share a color that they're feeling? Yes, thank you. Uh, moss green. Moss green. Yeah, calming. It's good. It's calming for you. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. Someone else? Yes. Uh, chestnut because it almost killed me outside during lunch. <laughs> so that was a real jolt, yeah. <laughs> it woke you up anyway. <laughs> okay, chestnut, fantastic. Some other colours, please. Yes. I feel like that reddish, uh, orange, the sea when you look into the sun and close your eyes. Mm. Oh, lovely reddish orange. Beautiful. Thank you, my dear. Anyone else? Yes. It's like between Melina and Brecht, the, the very warm you know? I don't know. Okay, lovely. Well, you can see it. That's the most important thing because that's what you're feeling. Fantastic. Someone else? Yes. Uh, for me, it's green as well because the picture of this man, which is able to move uh, with the wind. Lovely. Okay, so that's a feeling that you've got at the moment. Great. Anyone else? Yes. Green from the trees, we said. Green from the trees. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that, you've taken that with you. How lovely. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm in the mood of light gray. You're in the mood of light gray. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yes. Okay. This is a light blue that comes from your eyes. Oh, lovely. So, lovely. so this is vibrant. vibrant. Yes, yes. good, good, fantastic. All right, we're getting a lot of lovely energy in this room. Anyone else want to add their colors? Yes, please. Oh, red. 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 Yeah. red and uh, orange. Red and oh, beautiful of the sunset. Thank you, Angelica. Good. So we've all brought different things in with us. Okay, lots of different emotions, lots of different things. So what we're going to do is we're going to put them all in a big basket. So if you want to pop your arms out like this, we've all got a big basket in front of us. We brought in lots of things, things that we didn't share even in our check-in. Stress, tension, physical pain somewhere in your body, relationship issues, mental health issues. Whatever it is, what have you brought in that you just need to leave outside to come and focus on this workshop? Pop it in the basket. Put it in, see it all in the basket. It's a nice deep basket, mine certainly is. Keep it deep and, and throw it into that basket. Okay, now Christian is going to show you, because we've got a really big box out here, I don't want to drop my basket. We've got a big box out here on stage. Okay, he's bringing it on. Okay, there's the box. It's pretty big. He's doing the perimeter. Here we go. Okay, what we're going to do is put the basket on your lap, scoop out all of that stress, all of that tension, and throw it into the basket over the tops of people's heads. Ah, oh, wonder. Oh no, someone dropped some here. Didn't quite make it. Ugh, stress. Ugh. Okay, we'll pop that in. 
It's gone. Okay, it's in this big box here. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to move the box out of the way. Here we go. Off to the side. It's heavier now, isn't it's it? It's heavy. It's really heavy. <laughs> okay, there we go. It's just going to stay there for the workshop. Okay, now shake it out. Shake it out. Still stuff there, so you just got to shake it out. Get that it into your physical body. Fantastic. Okay. We're ready for our first exercise. We are ready to focus now. Okay, so the first exercise is called off balance. Everyone stand up in the space here somewhere, please. Off balance. Just somewhere in the space, just find a place to stand. Okay. Out we come. All right. Everyone stand up on their toes and then come back down again. And up on your toes and come back down again. And up on your toes and come back down again. Great. So easy, right? Yeah, great. All right, so this time we're going to stand up on our toes and just get to that point where you're going to fall a little bit and what happens? Your foot comes out to catch you. Try that. Good, excellent. Okay, try it again. Up on your toes. <laughs> And what happens when you lean out? There we go. Okay, good. You catch yourself. Up on your toes again. And there we go. Great. Okay. Last time we're doing it. Up on your toes, but this time you have got to balance here. You've got to balance because there's a chasm down there. And you do not want to fall. Okay, you really do not want to fall. So up on your toes, everyone. It's a big, a big chasm and, and I, I do not want to fall. So use your arms, use whatever you need to balance there. Okay, and then back down again. Whew. <laughs> okay, up on your toes again this time. Oh, we're on the top of a roller coaster and it stopped. And if we lean forward, we're going to go down. So balance there as best that you can. Okay. <laughs> And down. Well done, everyone. Okay, shake it out. Shake it out and take a seat, please. Shake it out. Take a seat again. Okay, and I'll just direct you to the screen. This is our post-it note for this exercise. But is it the right step? And our couple, our quotes from our book are, this is from Laura and Russell from the USA. They've been married for 50 years. They're both academics, actually. Have adventures together. Do things you're afraid of together. He helps me do things I'm terrified to do. And once I've done it, I feel this rush of joy. Sharing an adventure where you're scared together creates a bond unlike any other that's so wonderful. And from Stephen and Keith, who have been together for 30 years, they run a bed and breakfast together. What can I do to be a little bit more flexible and safe from another person's perspective? So, you know, giving up a little control and realise that the ride sometimes is just as enjoyable. Allow yourself to go with the flow rather than one way only. Okay, next exercise. This exercise is called... Ta-da! Okay, so we're all going to practice saying ta-da together. Do the lovely jazz hands. Here we go. Ready? And ta-da! Oh, good, but I'm not hearing you. A bit louder. Okay, ready? And ta-da! Fantastic. That's going to become part of the exercise. So I'm going to tell you a story now about a time when I failed. I'm so excited to tell you this story. So it was about 12 years ago and I was giving my first lecture at my university that I'm at now and I was terrified. I was so nervous. I had over 100 students there. Before I started, I was dropping everything. My palms went clammy. I went red in the face when I started. I skipped over words got everything completely messed up, I misplaced, I made a real fool of myself. I failed. Okay, now you can all give me a <gasps> ta-da. Ta Thank you. And now I will bow and you can applaud me. Thank you. I failed. Great. Okay. All right. So I'd like you to think of a time when you failed. Think of a time when you failed. Nothing too small and nothing too big. Think of a time when you failed. 
All right. Would someone like to come out and share their failure story with us? You'll get it to da. <laughs> That's your prize. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, I've got two people, so we'll just we'll have this. I don't, it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, great. So once you tell your story, and you've got to tell it proudly, we're proud of our failures. At the end, so that we know it's the end, if you can say, I failed, and we'll give you a ta da. Off you go. So um, I'm teaching interaction design, and we were having my first lesson ever together, and I was trying to explain how things should be self-explaining and easy to understand. While doing that, I had my nice presentation for three hours in a row on a crooked wall. I was complaining all the time that my pictures were not seen fully and there's something in the way like a steel beam. And in the end of the lesson, I found out that there's a, a curtain you can lower, which should be self-explaining because it's a well-designed building. Um, I found that out after three hours. Uh, in the end of my presentation, so I failed. Ta-da! And please bow. We want to give you applause too. Yay! Woo! Thank you. That was wonderful. And we have someone else. Come out. So this is a story about when I started studying about six or seven years ago. And I had my first module about graphic design. And we had to do um, posters, big posters. We had to uh, make them with things we cut out of magazines and put them together in a place. And then we scanned them in, and then they went into pretty pictures. Almost all of them got hung up on the wall. There was one poster missing, and that was my poster because it wasn't good enough. I got a bad grade, and I will never forget that. <laughs> I, I failed. failed. I failed, yes. Yes, ta-da! And bow. Oh, well done. Well done. Thank you. Does anyone else want to tell their failure story? It feels good. <laughs> Come on up, Daniela. Okay. Um. Ah, yes, thank you. Microphone here. Okay, uh, this is thrilling. <laughs> yeah, um, I was uh, thinking about a situation where a colleague um, asked me uh, to do a critic about a project uh, her students did. And it was in English. And I didn't talk in English for a long time. And I thought, oh, no problem, um, graphic design project. And I met uh, in this Zoom meeting and I just couldn't, speak one word and it was so um, I don't know in, in which uh, what situation I was it, like like you just collapsing and uh, nothing was uh, possible anymore <laughs> and um, I failed <laughs> Yay! Ta -da! Ta -da! and please bow thank you mm -hmm. anyone else would like to tell us their failure story I'd love to hear it. There we go, thank you. Good occasion to get rid of something. <laughs> <laughs> so it was in my, uh, 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 long time ago, I studied here in the Academy of Beaux Arts, uh, the, the, the Art Academy. And it was after one year, we are supposed to do a, a, a wall, what was made like a, a, a second approval, if you could stay, or uh, this was like a test. You should produce something and show something of your works. And I was kind of insecure because I had a lot of um, experimental um, objects. And other people had this, I don't know, more conceptual thing. So I was insecure. I put it, my things there together with 10 other people maybe or eight other people. And every time I put them there, somebody came and said, no, I, I need this wall. I have a concept. This must be on this wall. Okay, I said, okay, I move. And then I had the next place. And then the next person came and told me, oh, I need this space because I have a concept and it must be here, you know. So I was kind of insecure, and at the end, I, I was landing on the bench of the window. So I, I, I don't know, through my insecurity, I gave up a good place. So I was the only one who did not pass this um, test, I think, for years. 
<laughs> so it was, well, this, I failed. Ta-da! <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. And yes, it is cathartic. And I actually do get my students at the beginning, I tell all my students at the beginning of the lecture series often, you're going to fail this semester. All of you are going to fail. And, I'm, and they're going, what, what? But by the end of the semester, they do fail in the class. And I say, put your hand up, who's failed? Put your hand up, those that have failed. And they all put their hands up really proudly because they learnt through it. So these are the post-it notes that I have for this. I've got four for this one. You have to risk failing. If you succeed, you succeed. If you fail, you succeed. It's only in not trying that you fail. <laughs> Your sense of self-worth is in who you are, not in what you do. And we've been touching on that a lot for, through the workshops. You can be judged for what you do, but you can't be judged for who you are. And from our book, William and Mildred, married for 40 years, lost their son to cancer. Adversity makes you stronger, they said. And Pat and Tony married for 54 years. Tony was a Vietnam vet and had severe PTSD. You fail. We both failed, but you don't walk away. Okay, and just for some insights on these little exercises, I'm going to hand it over to Christian. Okay, so what we want you to do is to experience, and then I've got to tie it back to the theory, unfortunately, because then we've got to engage the frontal lobe. If you can, remember how you feel that we're actually applauding somebody's failure. The people who are out here that get applauded for their failure actually feel good. And what this does in the brain is it says to the amygdala, chill. It's okay if you fail because there are people who still love you. And because we are here together and we all know that we could each tell a failure story, then we could tell some of our big failure stories and feel really bad together. And that actually brings oxytocin to all of us to increase our resilience. When we were off balance, off balance is the essence of adversity. When you go back down to a center and you feel centered, that's when you've overcome and you feel okay again, you're upright again. So off balance is the stress and then getting back down is the self-writing of resilience. Our students tell us that they feel off balance all the time. I mean, that's terrible, quite frankly. How often do you feel off balance? Most of us here would have sometimes that we get back on balance. A lot of students don't. And then the check-in, the check-in is to clear our anterior cingulate gyrus, right, which uh, generates the empathy that we all here share. Because you see, when our head is full of the stuff our head is normally full of, mental pain, physical pain, relationship pain, whatever, we are focused on ourselves and on our stress. So if we take that stress, put it into a basket, then we actually free ourselves to open our empathy centers to each other. And so you actually feel, yeah, I'm part of a group here. This is okay. The other thing that we do is that we're putting together a tradition just for these people here. We now have one basket, one box, where all of our stress is in. We don't know each other's stress, but we know that we have stress and we're going through that together. And this builds resilience. Okay, so we're up to our Shakespeare interlude now. And uh, this is what Shakespeare had to say on resilience. So this is from Act 3, Scene 3 of Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida. The Greeks are at war with the Trojans. Act 3, Scene 3 is when things change. The military commander Ulysses has to convince Achilles 
to get up out of his bed and start being a hero again because Achilles is already a hero and he's grown fat and lazy and he doesn't want to do it anymore. And what Ulysses says is, look mate, forget about the short-term pleasure. We need you up out the front to inspire all of us. Perseverance, dear my Lord, keeps honour bright. To have done is to hang, quite out of fashion, like a rusty mail in monumental mockery. Take the instant way, for honour travels in a path so narrow that one but goes abreast. Keep then the path, for emulation hath a thousand sons that one by one pursue. If you give way or hedge aside from the direct forth right, like an entered tide, they all rush by, leaving you hindmost. Then what they do in present, though less than yours in past, must o'er top yours. For time is like a fashionable host that slightly shakes his parting guests by the hands and with his arms outstretched as if he would fly, grasps in the comer. The welcome ever smiles and farewell goes out sighing. Let not virtue seek remuneration for the thing that it was, for beauty, wit, high birth, vigour of bone, desert in service, love, friendship, charity, are subjects all to envious and calumniating time. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. Thank you. Christian's going to actually go through and uh, give a little bit of a commentary on each and apply it to resilience. Okay, so uh, we're going to go line by line because Shakespeare is not that easy to understand and show how this all relates to resilience. <laughs> Perseverance, dear my lord, keeps honour bright. Stick to what you need to do, Achilles. This way you'll get to feel good about yourself and keep your good reputation. To have done is to hang quite out of fashion, like a rusty male in monumental mockery. If you stop your personal growth, you will lose your skills and you'll eventually become useless. <laughs> That's it. Take the instant way, for honour travels in a path so narrow that one but goes abreast. Do what is yours in front of you. Nobody can do it for you. Your self-esteem depends on you doing what you're called to do. Keep then the path, for emulation hath a thousand sons that one by one pursue. Be the best you that you can be. Because if you don't, other people will come by and do what they do, and they're really just imitators like sheep. That's right. <laughs> If you give way or hedge aside from the direct forthright, like an entered tide, they all rush by, leaving you hindmost. If you compromise in this and sit back on your laurels, other people will come in before you and they will get the glory while you get forgotten. Then what they do in present, though less than yours in the past, must owe atop yours then what they're doing now, even though it's inferior to what you used to do, will look so good. <laughs> That's right. For time is like a fashionable host that slightly shakes his parting guests by the hands and with arms outstretched as if he would fly, grasps in the comer. Fashions change. Somebody else will easily become the flavor of the month. You'll be discarded and somebody else will become the flavour. The welcome ever smiles, but farewell goes out sighing. It may feel good to stop putting in effort, but it only leads to regret. Let not virtue seek remuneration for the thing that it was. Don't look for money or empty praise for the good things that you need to do. For beauty, wit, 
what are the other ones? High birth, uh, vigor of bone, desert in service, love, friendship, charity are subjects all to envious and calumniating time. Because things like beauty, wealth, health, and all our individual privileges, they're all going to fade. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. But just a little bit of kindness to somebody else brings us all closer together. That's it. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and we do have a post-it note for this. Don't deprive your future by overfeeding your now. Okay, your turn again. We're gonna have a real lot of fun with this one. Okay, this exercise is called, ooh, curiosity. <laughs> okay, we're going to do it together. Yep, I'll get them, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, so we're gonna say this together. Ooh, curiosity. Ooh, curiosity. Oh, you're not curious at all. Come on, really, get the child out in you. Ooh, curiosity, much better. Okay, great. All right, we're gonna divide the, the, the room into two groups. So this will be group one, and this will be group two. And um, I'm just gonna get group one to just stand up and you'll just be audience. You'll have a turn too, don't worry. And if you can start walking around the space already. And yeah, here, here, can you help me? Just grab some of these chairs, um, any of those. Just walking around the space and notice whatever's in the space, please. Perhaps some objects you haven't seen before. Just have a look at them as you go. Any sort of an objects that you see around, have a look at them. Yes, have a good look at them. Any objects around. Okay. Lots of objects coming here. You might want to have a look, a bit of a closer look. Okay, just a few more to go. All right. Okay, and when you see one that you really are quite shocked by or surprised by, I want you to go up to that object, find that one object, and do a little bit of a jump, like, woo! Okay, it's a big surprise. So go up to an object that you haven't seen before, choose one, go up to it, and don't, don't touch it yet. <laughs> I sound like a school teacher, don't I? Okay, go up to it, and big jump. Woo! Okay, all right, fantastic. Now, that is a really interesting object. So you wanna have a bit of a close look at it. So go and have a look at close, feel it, touch it. Now you can pick it up, I'll let you pick it up now. <laughs> have a look at the color, the texture. Okay, great, yep, yeah, fantastic. Whatever you see, put it against your skin. What does it feel like? Is it cold? What is it? Great, what is this object? Fantastic, really explore it. Be very curious about it, great. See what it can do, absolutely. <laughs> Give it a shake, whatever. That's fantastic. Okay, good, we're sharing an object here, even better. Okay, and now we're gonna put it down and we're going to point at it and say, wow, that's the funniest thing I ever saw. Okay, so we're gonna say, that's the funniest thing I ever saw together. Ready, and wow, that's the funniest thing I ever saw. Okay, great. We're gonna do it again, but this time, after we say, that's the funniest thing I ever saw, we're gonna burst into laughter because it's funny. And you can slap your thighs and you can snort and as much laughter in the room as possible. Ready, and wow. wow. That's, That's the, the funniest, funniest thing, thing I, I ever saw. saw. <laughs> well done. Well done, everyone. Okay. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Please go and sit down again. Take a seat. Please take a seat. Please take a seat. Wonderful. Great. 
Okay, take a seat. All right, group two, it's your turn. <laughs> okay, the, this exercise adapts a little bit differently um, halfway through. So same thing, just be very curious about anything that's in this space. Have a look around at it. Don't touch it, but just have a good look at around at things and just have a look at, at things. Don't touch them yet. Okay, just have a look at them. Then something that sort of takes your eye, but this time, find an object that takes your eye. You're not going to be surprised by it. You're actually going to be scared by it. Okay? So this time when you see it, I want you to do a little jump and a little <gasps> Okay, ready? Go up to the object and we're gonna do a bit of a jump. Ready? And <gasps> Okay, well done. Okay, one more time. This time we're going to do a, a, a little jump again. Ready and... <gasps> okay, this time we're going to point at it and say, Ooh, that's really scary. Okay? <laughs> All right, ready? And... <gasps> Ooh, that's, that's really, really scary. scary. Okay, fantastic. Now we're going to do it again. And we're going to say, Ooh, that's really scary. And then we're going to run away as fast as we can. Ready? And, ooh, ooh that's, that's really, really scary. scary. Run, run, run. <laughs> that's very good, that's very okay. good. Okay, and wherever you're hiding now, the exercise isn't finished. You're still curious about it though. So you're gonna come up to it and see how close you can get to it. Not too close, okay, remember it is scary. It is definitely scary. So as close as you can get to it, Ugh, how close, how courageous are you? Can you get very close to it? Or is it too scary? Is it really that scary? Can I get close to it? What's it gonna do? Can I get close to it? And if you're really, really courageous when you get up to it, good, someone's just going around theirs and not too sure. You might, oh good, someone's just starting to touch it a little bit. You might want to touch it a little bit with your finger if you're courageous. And if you're brave, maybe with your foot. Try it, oh, someone just stand on this. <laughs> Touch it with your foot a little bit. Okay. All right, just close. All right, good. Thank you very much. Well done, everyone. Okay, shake it out. Shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. Shake it out. Shake it out. You're a courageous bunch, aren't you? <laughs> I love it. Okay, so we've got some post-it notes for this. Laughter is the best medicine, of course. Uh, this is actually an Australian kookaburra. Kookaburras make a laughing sound. Uh, and so uh, at four o'clock in the morning usually, which isn't a good time for them to laugh, but you know, at least we wake up to laughter in Australia. <laughs> uh, and the next one is, life is full of snakes and ladders. And then our quote is, this is from Elizabeth and Peter. Elizabeth married 60 years. Elizabeth um, grew up in a family where she wasn't allowed to speak at all and talk about what she felt or anything she wanted. I was terrified. I grew up afraid. I was shut up in my head. We got over that together. I learned to trust and now I can say anything because it is safe. Okay, our last exercise is called My Rhythm. And we're all going to be involved in this one. So everyone up, please, again. You can use this space or this space down here, okay? My rhythm. So anywhere, just anywhere around. And once you're in the space, let's just start walking in curves. Make a curve on the ground, draw a curve on the ground as you walk around, curve on the ground. Curve, if you run into someone, do something. <laughs> curve, 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 curve. Curve, curve. Okay, we're gonna make right angles now. Right angles, we're changing that to right angles, so sharp contrast with those right angles. You're probably definitely gonna run into someone here. 
If you run into someone, move. <laughs> right angles. Right angles. Woo! Move. <laughs> right angles. Good. Okay, right angles. Great. Now make yourself as big as you can in the space. Really big. I'm big. Take up the space. Everyone take up as much space as you possibly can. Oh, if you run into someone, move. <laughs> ah, if you run into someone, do something. Lovely. Hugs. I'm loving it. <laughs> big, big in the space. Now small. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Tiny, tiny. Contrast it. Small, tiny. Little mice. Tiny, tiny, tiny. tiny. Not small enough. Smaller, smaller, smaller. Tiny. I can still see you. Specks. Specks on the ground. That's it. Tiny, 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 tiny. Tiny, tiny. Incy, wincy. <laughs> okay, great. All right, everyone up, and we're back. Oh my gosh, we've got a tightrope in front of us. We have to balance. Okay, so you've got to balance on that tightrope. It's not easy. Okay, walk on. You need your arms out to balance. If you run into someone, do something. <laughs> yes, but what is right? Okay, so balance. That's it. Oh, good. We're going to run into each other. Ooh, I think I have to go this way on the tightrope. Fantastic. Yeah, don't fall. <laughs> Keep that balance, keep the balance. Keep the balance. Okay, well done. And last one, we're gonna make some lovely shapes on the ground and we're gonna repeat them. I'm gonna do a triangle and keep repeating the triangle. So you choose a shape and work the shape out and repeat it on the ground. Repeat it, repeat it. Repeat, oh, we've got some lovely squirrelies here. Keep repeating the shape wherever you go. Okay, what else am I seeing? I'm seeing a square. Oh, that's an interesting, that's like a snake. Keep, keep it, keep going with it, keep the shape going. Keep repeating it. If you run into someone, move. <laughs> okay, oh, look at this lovely mosaic we've made on the ground, beautiful. Oh, there's a hexagon, that's very challenging, whoever tried that one. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Okay, well done everyone. Give yourselves a clap. And take a seat. <laughs> shake it out, shake it out, shake it out as you're taking your seat. Shake it out, shake it out. Shake it out. Okay. So it's time now for our checkout. No, it isn't. Oh, we've got, we've got, oh, that's so right. Just to tie in what we just did with the theory, um, we embedded some design concepts into that, things like contrast, scale, balance, and things like that that you may have recognized, you may not, it doesn't matter. But it becomes a comfort zone for you to be familiar with what you do. The thing is that in life, you have to do what you do while other people do what they do, and you're gonna bump into them, and so you just have to move, or you've just gotta do something. But the point of the exercise is the anterior cingulate gyrus empathy, knowing that you are accepted and you've gotta do what you've gotta do while you let other people do what they've gotta do, and to work in that particular space. The ooh, curiosity, um, Resilience is overcoming obstacles. So overcoming fear in that, but also overcoming excitement and seeing life curiously as though it's laughter. This releases dopamine in the brain. And uh, I know we tend to think we get dopamine from our movies and from our drugs and all of that, but curiosity is motivated by dopamine to keep us connected with reality itself. And the Shakespeare was all about going for long-term contentment rather than short-term pleasure. And the post-it notes for the last exercise, structure and rhythm give your life stability and be the best you that you can be. The quote that we have, this is Bruce and Susan from Zimbabwe, married for 49 years. They're professional ballroom dancers. They're still competing. When we're in conflict, we tell each other to dance each other's steps. So when Bruce 
He's in conflict with, with Susan. Bruce says, dance my steps for a while. And Susan says, dance my steps for a while. So they see each other's point of view. Okay, now it's time for our checkout. Okay, so really important to have a check in and check out. We've shared a lot of experiences together. So instead of a color this time, I think I'm going to ask you what garden tool you feel like at the moment. <laughs> what garden tool? So any tool or anything that's used in a garden. So my garden tool, I feel like I have been digging a lot, digging for resilience, so I am a shovel or a spade. So that's the garden tool I feel like at the moment. Does anyone else want to share their garden tool? I yes. Lovely. So you're a cherry picker. I love that. Okay. Someone else. Yes. Okay, okay. You're feeling like a ladder. Okay, yes. Plant seeds. Plant seeds. Because yeah, we all have the possibility to seed something good every day. So that you're feeling like the seeds. Fantastic. Lovely. Anyone else want to share what their garden is? I don't know the name, but this plant's like a cork. Sorry, it's a. This part's like a cork. Oh, yes, a rake, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's weeb and there are no other shit, but it's all the good things. <laughs> ah, getting all the good things back, fantastic. Okay, anyone else feeling like a certain garden tool that they'd like to share? Yes? I'm a chair to count the cigar. Oh, a re oh, absolutely. <laughs> Got to relax in the garden, I love it. A reclining chair, lovely, thank you. Anyone else? Yes? Favorite fertilizer. Fertilizer, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, I love that, that's fantastic. We've got to get the seeds into the fertilizer and get that happening so that it's, we're going to have this lovely garden and we've got a, a, a rake and we've got, we're going to have a beautiful garden here. Anyone else want to add to our garden? A swing. A swing, we need a swing for fun. <laughs> yeah, also for you. something. Okay, lovely, lovely. Okay, thank you very much. Now, our box is still over here. We have been carrying all those stresses together. Should we leave everything here in the box? Sorry, what was the vote there? Yeah, let's leave it all there. Because it's a together experience and having a box in what's become our space means that we are now part of a group. We all know that we go through stresses. We don't know our individual stresses, but we've put them there together. And because we've uh, had more trust, we can reveal our inner garden tool rather than just our inner color. But we now feel a sense of belonging and we have the tradition of the box so that we can have these experiences together because together experiences are what help build resilience. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening to our Impulse on Resilience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>